Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 23, with myself Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. So this week, Sam's going to bring us up to date with everything industry-wise, and then we, well, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing Stephen Longhurst, and um, yeah, we're going to go through that, and we're going to also be discussing franchises, and the impact that franchises basically have within the film industry, if they're a good thing or they're a bad thing, but we'll come to that. So anyway, over to you, Sam, for industry. So it's still the Cannes film market, so there's loads of packages flying around. So one film we're paying attention to is that Netflix are looking to make their documentary Varunga, which came out a couple of years ago, about um, protecting gorillas. Actually got Oscar nominated, Leonardo DiCaprio produced it. They're Ooh. now looking to do you know, a film version of it. Ooh. And DiCaprio's come on board to produce it still. Don't think he's going to be in it because it's not really about, you know, a white man saving the gorillas. Um, but what's really interesting is Barry Jenkins, who did Moonlight, um, he is now come on board to write the film. And he's been doing this quite a lot recently, just writing different films for people. And he's a, an amazing writer. I mean, he's an Oscar winning writer. I was going to say, Moonlight was mm. Oscar, wasn't it? Yeah, so I'm really curious of like what that could bring together. Who's directing it? Who's in it? None of that's been announced yet because these are just packages they're trying to sell at the market. One thing which I genuinely found quite surprising, and I just thought, guess anything goes now, is Michael Keaton is coming back to play Batman. <laughs> so yeah, like, there's a Flash film being made at the moment, which has been tried to be made for so many years. There's been about five directors attached to the Flash film who have fallen out. And I think a lot of that's to do with the internal DC, how it keeps changing, and because of the Joker's success, now they're like, all right, we don't need to connect dots too badly. So with the idea of Batman potentially, and again, this isn't, it's not dotted on the line with the contract, but it's probably going to happen, is that Michael Keaton will come back as old man Batman and he'll teach any new characters, young characters. And because Flash, they can run really fast and times can change and multiverses. I don't know, I'm not, I don't know comic books, I, but I, it I, made I, sense when I read it. I hate having this conversation, but they're trying to make... That the old Batman, the Iron Man of the sort of like bringing that universe together because well, they've failed on the know, universe. I, I think what they're doing, like, so me and Sam had this discussion earlier, is that it's like they're segregating all of their stories, mm. so they have different versions at different time periods. So it's not going to affect the Robert Pattinson no. Batman. That Nothing that's a standalone. It. It's its own entity. Yeah, yeah. It's a new like a, a refresh, a reboot. And um, but Michael Keaton's going to replace um, Ben Affleck in that version so like the Justice League and all that so I wonder be in the timeline of like Aquaman Wonder Woman yeah, right. do we remember like the, the cartoon in the early 2000s Batman Beyond yeah I wonder if that's going to be the next step because that's where that pit fits absolutely perfectly because it is old man Batman so old man Batman so we'll see but Christina Hodson who wrote um, the recent Harley Quinn film she's writing this new film she's also writing the Batgirl film after Josh Whedon was replaced because you know he's a bit of a not the feminist icon people thought he was. So, like, she seems to be recrafting where DC's going. So these stories are all, like, I think they're trying to push her as potentially becoming the... The fist. The Kevin almost. fig, you know, yeah, that's yeah. what they've always wanted. And maybe she's the one who's going to do it. We'll see. It'd be interesting. Like, in terms of DC, I'm a big comic book fan and stuff. Um, oh, you but, are. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> In terms of DC, I've never really got on board with any of their films. It's just big blockbuster epic battles and like stuff blowing up. Lost. And, yeah, and it's heavily CGI'd. And then there's no really repercussions afterwards. No. Marvel falls into the same pitfalls, but their storytelling is a lot better. Um, well, we'll get into that more when we get into franchises later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, other packet, the other film that's uh, currently being fished around the market is a film which I really hope actually happens. So Michael Mann is looking to do a film about Enzo Ferrari with Hugh Jackman playing it. The reason why I want this to happen is Michael Mann's been trying to make this film for like 20 years. And when you watch a Michael Mann film, they always stand out, you know? Like, a personal shout out for me, I absolutely love The Thief. It's an outstanding film in a lot. It made me realize how much Drive basically just copied it. It's a film worth hunting out. So this package in particular, like, He's been trying to make his film with Christian Bale, who of course ended up being in Ford versus Ferrari. So clearly Bale, you wanted some Ferrari at some point. You know? 
Um, yeah, so that's that's currently going around Khan, and there's there's loads of different ones at Khan. It's all casting announcements. There's still the big question of is anyone going to buy any of this when there's so much in- uncertainty going on? Mm. We'll see. On a personal note with Trash Arts, Senseless has gone past its 100%. So we hit our target Ooh. of 1,500. I just want to say a it. massive thank you to everyone who's put a single penny, dollar, whatever into this. It's something that we genuinely are quite like surprised and shocked by. And it feels great to know that we can make this film. And yeah, it's, it's a crazy one. Um, we are still extending it. So we, uh, the Indiegogo is now up to 2,000 because we want to do some crazy extra effects. If you can support it, the Indiegogo will be down below. But if you can't, I just want to say, yeah, big thank you to everyone who's, who's put support into this. And we hope we're going to get some on-set recordings of us there to put for the podcast. So you will get to hear a bit of what it was like to shoot this film. And also for our Indiegogo subscribers, um, we'll try and do more sort of test shoots and stuff within the coming weeks. So you've got a bit of extra content to kind of bring you up to speed to what we're doing. And uh, I, I second what Sam said. Thank you very much for your support. Um, honestly, we didn't think that we could potentially do this, but we obviously have a lot of fandom. <laughs> so, yeah. It's feeling, thank you. Uh, feeling a lot of pressure yeah, now yeah. to deliver on it, though, <laughs> isn't it? It's like, uh-huh. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for industry, Sam. That was cool. Yeah. I, I like um, the DC stuff. Like hopefully it, it, it has a turnaround. Um, so Sam had the pleasure of interviewing Stephen Longhurst. So we've worked with Stephen Longhurst in the past. He's a, an accredited filmmaker, actor, and um, yeah, he's, he's local to us in Portsmouth. Um, so yeah, over to you, Sam, for the interview. I'm on Trash Arts Take with Stephen Longhurst. Stephen Longhurst is an actor and a filmmaker who's actually local to us and, in my opinion, a kind of film legend because you've been working for such a long time. How are you doing, man? Legend, yeah, all right. You've got leg some legendary stories. Yeah, leg end, maybe. I don't know about legend. Yeah. Are you doing good? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Are you you getting carrying fever with this lockdown? Not yet. No, just trying no. to keep as busy as possible with as much yeah, creative been, stuff. Yeah. So it's, been, it's been good in a way with me because I've dug out some old stuff that I shelved a little while ago, and I've been going through that again. Oh, that's fantastic. That's that's yeah. like. I've seen a lot of people doing that. Um, Jay yeah, Slimpy yeah. did it recently, I think. Um, yeah. So let's get into the questions. Uh, what got you into filmmaking and uh, acting? Um, I was going into filmmaking because I was watching films from an, er- from an early age and I just enjoyed watching grown-ups being silly and being paid to be silly. You know, as a, as a kid, you're always being told to, to grow up and act your age, but, uh, you know, you don't... Saturday morning picture club and you watch cowboys and Indians and you think, this is great and you think, oh, no, I could do that yes. <laughs> so I, I wanted to get into it of course at school in the drama club um, you know you put on plays at school and um, we did it in conjunction with the the girls school then the boat so they brought girls in so uh, it was a good combination and that's that set me up <laughs> Um, so in your so like what came first for you then was it wanting to direct or was it going into the acting well like what was the first film you directed and what was the first film you acted in that made you feel like this was a career path oh um I'm trying to think of it trying to think of the sequence um when I I mean when I started into the acting I, I found I wasn't perhaps as deep into the acting as the other people were and I was more interested in the words on the page and how the director worked and brought the, mm. the stuff from the page up onto the stage because it was all stage stuff, you know, and I think that an interesting process. Um, the, the first film, I mean, I started a little Super 8 Bewley camera making little films with your mates that were cowboys and Indians and hit men and uh, monsters and things like that. Um... First, first film I actually directed, I sent into a festival, was a film called The Guardian of Cthulhu. That was a that was a thing where a Victorian family got sent a dagger that their father had from the days of the Raj, and he'd taken it from the cult of Cthulhu, and some people turned up and wanted it back. 
Oh, yes. But, no, that was the first one, yeah. When was that? That was back in the 70s sometime. So was that shooting with um, uh, 8mm? Or? Yeah, yeah that, was on, that was on Super 8, yeah, with the, the beauty camera. So um, and it went on it went on from there. So I, I, put, I sent it into a film festival and got back a, a critique along the lines of um, take the camera off this person and uh, <laughs> don't let him near another one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I actually enjoyed the process of writing and, and going around and finding people and, and watching them get up and act out what, uh, what I'd written. That, that was a drug then, and you, you're hooked. Yeah. No, I can definitely agree with that. So yeah. was, it short, was it like after that time leading more into the 80s where you start working with Michael J. Murphy? Um, yes, because that, that came about with, um, I mean, especially Mike. I mean, I, I met him. I didn't realise I'd met him. Um, I was working at the King's Theatre and they came and filmed Tommy. Yeah. Ken Russell filmed Tommy and I was an extra in Tommy. Yeah, I just uh, saw that on your IMDb. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And he came down because he worked for a photographer just down the road, Tickner's in Albert Road. He, he walked down and took some photos for the evening news. Um, but it wasn't until years later that I realised we'd met. I was in a play, um, and he came along. He was looking for a girl to be in a play. Um, came round afterwards and had a drink, and I met him, and we chatted, and uh, you know, realised we had a common sort of liking for films and doing films. And that was that was late seventies, seventy eight, seventy nine, something like that. Yeah. Tell us about some of the um, early roles you acted in for him, like the early 80s kind of video nasty era. Yeah. Uh, the, we, were, we were due to go and shoot a film in Tunisia, but that didn't come about. Um, and then it went, I carried on seeing him, and it wasn't until the 80s, he, the VHS uh, market sort of opened up. Um, he set up his little distribution company called Custom Video, and he wanted to release a double, a double feature, as it were, of um, Invitation to Hell and The Last Night. Nice. Um, Invitation to Hell. I was the possessed farm hand taken over by the demon that was on the farm, um, and the last night I was a, an escaped nutter that got into a, a theatre and killed the people in the play. Oh, lovely. It's all jolly, it's all jolly stuff. <laughs> Blue Peter turned it down, yeah. But, uh, yeah, he, want, he shot Rose because he wanted to get into sort of his own distribution then. And, of course, the video market could let you do that rather than film. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, it's like, it's obviously, back then, you had, like, a beautiful kind of community with Michael J. Murphy. You had, obviously, Phil Linden, um, Jude, um, yeah. Patrick Oliver, you know, like, everyone together... Yeah, and, and hey, we're still all together, we're still... I know, it's beautiful. Bit, bit, yeah, bits of us are missing, but we're still all together, yeah. How does it feel to, like, have that? Because obviously we, we as filmmakers strive to have some sort of community around us so we can, you know, bring out the best creativity. Oh, yeah. What was it like in the 80s having that? Well, yeah, well, in the 80s, I mean, working with Mike, it was it was like, um, you know, a family get-together because you had the familiar faces and you felt... You, f you felt safe acting with them, you know, mm. you knew what they were capable of, you knew what they were going to do. Um, uh, Mike just let you let you run as long as you had the basic idea of what you're doing with your character, he more or less let you run with it. And I say, it was a nice, safe family atmosphere, you, you knew the people and, and you got on, it was, it was good. What would you say, do you have like a particular favourite acting role you did? Um... What, in Mike's films? Well, Mike's films, it may, maybe it was outside of Mike's films. Okay. Um, I'd say my favourite one with Mike was a film called Quailen, where I was a, uh, a millionaire uh, landowner and uh, my wife tried to kill me. I ended up in a wheelchair. She was in an affair with the gardener and they spent the film devising ways to kill me. It's a jolly thing, but I got <laughs> to stay clean and... Um, I had the most screen time, so I was happy with that one. <laughs> when was that? <laughs> that was, oh, God, that was 80, 80, 80, 82, 82, 
So you guys, like, you just consistently kept getting those films out there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Well, it was, uh, yeah, you know, you had a, a thing then. We used to, people would take two weeks off for the summer holiday mm. and, uh, and, you know, go off with Mike somewhere and shoot a film. So cool. <laughs> yeah. Especially with, like, because it's not an open opportunity for filmmakers, especially on a more independent level in the 80s and early 90s and stuff, because technology wasn't as available. That's right, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, you've got to bear in mind at that time, film, you know, was expensive. Yes, yeah. Um, 16, so, I mean, I shot on 8mm, I could never afford to go up to 16mm, but Mike was shooting on 16mm, and, and that was, you know, that cost money. Mm. He, he taught us, <laughs> I was thinking today, he taught us economy, because when he got people together, we could, uh, we could write off to film labs and ask for what they called ends, unexposed film yeah. um, that they'd had in, so you could write off and say, remote the film, could we have some ends if you have any? And we used to write to Kodak and Hector and people like that, and gather him up ends so, to save money. Yeah. They taught us economy. Mm. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. So, like, if we look at, like, nowadays with um, with you, obviously, do, you've done a lot of short films for our anthologies, for Philia, for the Home Video series. Yeah. Um, and you've obviously been doing acting with us as well. You you're, you and the whole gang are in Fixer. And that's yeah. coming out next year. And yes. How, how do you see, like, the, the independent film scene in the UK, like, from what you've seen right now? So we're talking, like, Tom Tomney Rutter in the Midlands, the horror on yeah. sea guys. How do you feel it is right now? The, the kind of community vibe and comparison. Um, okay. Well, it's it's you know it will it will survive. It will it will keep going. It will replicate. It will new ideas will bubble through. New mm. talent will bubble through. You know it it will always be there. Um, and the advantage you've got these days is you've got so many platforms it can come out on. Yeah. So it's. Uh, you know, it's gonna it's gonna thrive as it would any time because people who want to make the films will will get on and make them whatever. So and yeah, the, it will it will thrive and it will grow and it's it's cyclical. It will generate new ideas. Um, you know, it, it will thrive. It is one of those consistent things that if people want to make films, they'll find a way to make films. That's right. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel like? Um, because obviously, like I said at the beginning, you do have a legacy. You've been you've been doing films for a long time, and you've got a lot of respect from. I wouldn't say like younger filmmakers, but you know, like as the kind of crowds you go to, you see at cult um, festivals and stuff, they recognise yeah. who you are. They're excited to talk to you. How does that feel when you, when? Because I know, like obviously, uh, uh, the festival we did earlier in the year, the Real Indie Festival, some yeah. of the Midland guys, like I know Tom, he was excited to meet you guys, and yeah, yeah. how does it feel? Uh, well, actually, uh, actually, it's embarrassing because <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know I wouldn't say I was an actor. I remember I was doing a play, and a director was uh, standing there with his hand on his brow, saying, "Oh, I'm not, I'm not feeling," you know. And, and I said to him, "Well, I'm, I'm just dressing up, pretending." <laughs> and he went, he seemed, he went, he went berserk. Um, so to call me an actor is, is a stretch you know I stand in front of the camera I say the lines and, and don't fall over I'm getting there <laughs> and, I mean it's, it's nice um, you know I think if Mike was around today he'd find it amusing that he's got a cult following for Invitation to Hell because he did that as a as a throwaway film as a filler to go on with the suspense film that he was doing the last night which was his first love. Um, so it's on, but it's not to to denigrate if people find it, you know, if find if, if they like it and um, they want to know what's going on and want to talk about it, I'm more than happy to do that. But I certainly wouldn't call myself an actor. I wouldn't say I was a, a cult, had a cult following. <laughs> I've got a cat following me, but I haven't got a cult following. <laughs> Well, what have you been working on, like, recently? Um, have you been doing more directing over acting? Oh, oh, certainly, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I try not to... I try not to act. Um, uh, I was due to go away, actually, with Pat. Oh. 
earlier in the year, um, I went to the cottage down in New Forest. We're going to go away and shoot a film called 333. But that's all stopped with this COVID thing. Mm. But uh, So I'm looking to do that hopefully next year when they let us have the cottage back. Um, as I say, I've dug out some stuff I did a while back, a film called Scammers, um, which is a scam operation goes wrong. Um, and another one actually with Phil called um, Just Do It, where he's a um, he's a psychiatrist that uh, gets people to commit crimes on his behalf. Nice, that's, that's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they'll be released uh, next year. Excellent. When I say released, that's due to lack of evidence. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure there'll be plenty of uh, open <laughs> venues to release it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I just say, I mean, the last, the last stuff I've been doing is the stuff for you, the little short films, which is good. I like doing those. It gives me a chance to write and direct films and put people in them. And, uh, you know, the way you do them with the anthology things, they come out and it's good for the people in them because they, they're being seen. So, I'm glad, man, and I hope that you continue yeah, doing anthologies yeah, with us. Yeah, win-win all round, yeah. Yeah. So the, my last question for you, really, is I kind of ask everyone this question. Some people will go on about budgets, and I understand that. But there, has there ever been a dream kind of, like, performance you'd like to do or a dream film you'd ever want to make if you ever were well, given I've just... The budget. Yeah, let's say you've got Ooh. the magical monies there. It's, you know... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I... Personally, I'd like to go back and do a big budget version of the Hammer film, The, the Devil Rides Out. Ah, OK, the, it's about the cult, isn't it? Yeah, I think that one is ripe for a remake and with the, the technology you got nowadays, you know, you've still got the good story. Mm. You know, Richelieu, Richelieu tries to get his friend out of the satanic cult and all the things that go on. But I think today, with the special effects you've got, the actors you've got, um, you know, go and run with it. Isn't that based on a book? Sorry? Isn't it based on a book? Yeah, it's a Dennis Wheatley book. It's a... Surely you could get rights and do your own version. No, I don't. <laughs> probably not. Wow. I think, yeah. I, I, think, uh, I think actually the estate of Christopher Lee's got the Dennis Wheatley ah. rights. Yeah, because they, they were friends, yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us, man. It's been really good just um, hearing a bit more about, like, who you are and what you've done. Okay, then, yeah. And uh, thank you for calling me a legend. Yeah. <laughs> Make no. a change from Bell End, yeah. <laughs> no right. worries, man. Have okay, a lovely then. day. Speak to you soon. Yeah. Talk to you later. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. Thanks for that, Sam. Good interview with uh, Stephen. And, uh, yeah, so this week, guys, we decided that we wanted to discuss franchises and whether or not they're a good thing for film or they're a bad thing and uh, whether or not they've become stale or they're still positive within the film industry. Yeah, so we thought we'd start out by defining what a franchise is. Um, so a franchise, a definition on Google is just an authorization granted by a company to a group enabling them to carry out specified commercial activities. Um, so in terms of a film, what that, what that essentially means is um, it's the company has basically asked the, the creators to continue making these things and, and, and has commissioned the Keep continued the activity it. of it. It's um, so like Disney was so it's not, it, it's like it's not a sequel that's come from a creative part in the in the first place it's more from a, a, a financial perspective and business perspective what this is is it's definitely a double-edged sword because yes it is monopolized just to make money to keep that franchise going keep the keep all the crossbreeding of you know like toys computer games all those things because if you've got more films to sit to keep the story going that's generally a lot easier than if the film stops and you have to then generate new stories yeah because most i mean not not every computer game, because obviously there are a lot of like Spider-Man games which don't stick to the films. They do their own thing and they become their mm. own computer game franchise in that regards. But generally speaking, they stick to the... like. I remember when I used to play games on the PS2, <laughs> the Lord of the Rings game was just the Lord of the Rings game with the movies. It was, yeah, the film. It was yeah. just the story, but you ran through killing things. That was so hard. <laughs> Return of the King was so hard. <laughs> but it's that like almost companion piece. And I think that's what um, those franchises are allowed to do. <clears throat> if you look back at um, why franchises kind of like started in some ways is look at those kind of comedy acts in the 1920s your uh, Buster Keatons your um, Laurel Hardy those kind of guys 
And you look at, after that, you've got the whole birth of the first monster movies, Dracula, Wolfman, mm. uh, Frankenstein, all these kind of things. To keep people going to cinema, and, and I mean, I have, this is not like a guaranteed historical perspective. This is my perspective. Right? Yeah, yeah. But in my mind, to keep cinema going in the early days, franchises allowed that because it allowed a familiarity. Mm. You have to remember, when people first saw the first film of the train just, just a clip of a train going past. People jumped out the way because mm. they thought the train was going to come from. They'd never experienced it. <laughs> That's a crazy thought. So how do you ease people into this new kind of medium? You ease them in with stories that have been told before mm. and franchises. Yeah. Familiarity keeps the money flowing. And unfortunately, for cinema to grow, it has to be a financial success. Mm. It's just now we've got to a point where it is literally the only... In, in most cases, the only kind of consideration. And they're not even telling you about the first film. They're going, this film will potentially connect to this spin-off and this story and this and this and this. <laughs> and it used to be kind of restricted to a medium that sort of made sense with, with Marvel, DC, and these comic books, yeah? Mm. That's how comic books rip. Makes sense. But because it made a lot of money there, they're like, well, how can we do this to every single franchise possible? And I can't... I don't know what's been a successful other one. Fast and Furious is well, no. probably the only one I'll give you one, one that was probably the, the biggest success and still continues to be is James Bond. Yeah, yeah. So what, the, the early 60s, 61, I think, Doctor No? And even before that, you had Casino Royale, but that was like, it's not linear. It's not in the... But this is that thing of, um, again, that's almost like that companion piece sort of thing. It's a bigger medium to tell those stories, but they were books, weren't they? Yeah. Mm. It's, it's, Initially, um, but it's kind of gone off oh, yeah, on its yeah. own. But because of the success of it, it became its own given right. And mm. they started creating their own stories or adaptations of different books or mix of different books and then made into films. But this is the weird thing with Bond. And I feel like it's one of the rare franchises that sort of gets away with it. Godzilla gets away with it, but probably more in Japan. They become like an institutionalized part of culture. Yeah. So no one ever goes, oh, another Bond film. They go, oh, a different interpretation of Bond. Yeah. Mm. And no one ever goes, oh my god, what, 25, 26? No one thinks about that. I yeah. think it. I think it became stale though. Towards the end of Pierce Brosnan, is it? It was, um, quite strong. Golden Eye is a great film, um, and then he just tailed off, and it became too quirky mm. and too random, and like you had all this CGI coming in. It was just like farcical for Bond, and it's farcical anyway. Yeah. But then they, they kind of grounded it again with Casino Royale. And I think the 2006 version of Casino Royale has to be my favourite Bond film. I think and then it just built on that. When, when you look at it, Bond is the most successful franchise that's allowed itself to constantly reboot when it gets stale. Because yeah. mm -hmm. every franchise... But no one ever questioned to, it. Yeah. Like you think about when we go back to Marvel, and not particularly um, Disney's side, but 20th Century's Fox, use of X-Men. How many times has X-Men been attempted to be rebooted? Yeah. And it just doesn't have the same flavor of why people liked it first. And I think Bond is the only one that successfully keeps rebooting itself, allowing that franchise to continue however long it wants. I think because it's gone on so long, um, people don't ever second guess or question the fact that Bond will change. It's just an acceptance. It's like, yeah. it's, happen it, you know, it's like everyday life. You wake up, you breathe. Like, I think that's pretty much what Bond is now. It's so the same effect as Doctor Who, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's so we look at it. the toxicity of... Um, but they have an explanation in that. Oh, well, yeah, they do. Yeah, a yeah. regeneration, yeah. whereas, yeah, Bond is just like, oh, it's a new Bond. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. Those are the, like, the rare ones that are just relying on that same character. When they try to rebuild into like, well, here's a new set of characters, but really they're in the same world. And I guarantee everybody will love them because of the nostalgia element. Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> so you get a weird reaction. So just, the new Star Wars movies did not not make money. They made tons of money. So it hit that financial side of franchises and yeah. the success of what that is. But then you got this weird, I know we talked about it before, but with the fandom, mm. there was a toxicity within what an, of a franchise's expectations. I don't and think Star we should be Wars, on a podcast together talking about Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Star Wars is that rare Breaking one. The rules. <laughs> but, but you see what I mean? Like Star Wars is that rare franchise where you get that toxicity of, well, I know this franchise and I expect that from it. Usually, mm. the ones who are in control of what they think expected is the studios or the rare case of Fast and Furious, mm. which seems to me to be a franchise that has allowed Vin Diesel to still exist. Can, can I just touch uh, on... Sorry, can I just touch on one point before you go on? <clears throat> we can come back to Fast and Furious. I think, yes, with um, Star Wars... They got it wrong in terms of the films, and I feel like a lot of them were rushed, and they should have had a clear plan. They bought, what, in 2013? They bought it off George Lucas. Might have been earlier than that. 
and then they literally jumped in and did a film. And if they had a, taken their time and worked it out, it could have been a lot more structured and better and they could have had one director solely throughout. That's not to say that I don't like the sequel trilogy. I just think it was very messy um, in terms of filmmaking. But one thing that they did get right was Mando. Well, yeah, but sure, Mando, but... they give it, they give it to a creative person like John Farrow, and he did. Listen, you're talking more from the creative side of franchises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the thing. Like, yeah, the, the biggest problem franchises do is that old saying, you know, don't run before you can walk. Yeah, mm. that is the problem when they say we're going to set up a second and a third, and then there might be this, 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 and you just like just make the first one. But I think sometimes <laughs> with some of them films, because like you said about Fast and Furious that never started out as a franchise no. it was a film a standalone film about cars because like, I, don't, I don't know why but I remember like at the time it was probably what well, early noughties and there was this massive fix for street racing and yeah. they had need for Definitely. speed and stuff and you could customise your own car I remember playing that game and it was awesome um, and then Fast and Furious came out it was oh this is really cool like, I love these characters and they just went we'll make a second too Fast, Too Furious, but they introduced new characters, didn't really work, so they went for a third. Tokyo Drift didn't really work, so they waited a number of years. I think it was like 2008 when they brought out, um, fa uh, was it Fast and Furious? Yeah, the fourth so one. So the fourth one. Um, <coughs> and then it's basically like a, almost a slow reboot or soft reboot, but it was a continuation. And then it just it had a massive yeah, response. Yeah, it was ingenious. And then it just it went back. And it, like the farcical of them... Um, movies it went from being about street racing to their fighting crime and like dealing with like Maybe, world terrors and yeah. stuff with cars and like but you accept it now you th they, yeah. they have become a, they have somehow Fast and Furious made itself institutionalised as a franchise that we just accept I still love watching them as, as I've a never spectacle. seen a single one oh, but I know about them and awesome. it makes me go alright I'm happy for this to exist <laughs> as a spectacle they're awesome when you watch it you're sitting there and you're thinking that wouldn't happen but fuck me that's cool like, <laughs> if we um if we look at like the the one thing that most people will think of when they think of franchises away from you know current you're gonna say marvel no, horror yeah, yeah. Um, horror franchises from the 80s you know oh yeah yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the the classics is the thing and you think about the 80s what is the 80s the 80s is like pure capitalism yeah you got yeah. reagan you got thatcher and, and cocaine they, yeah <laughs> yeah and crack and they've milked franchises like crazy you know how there's i mean i'm okay with halloween it. Because you watch them later on and there's like a TV series and you just mm. follow their story and you're like, this is great. I'm just following Jason, you know, one minute he's killing people, next minute it's New York and then he pops off space. Sounds great. <laughs> but back then, mm. it literally made people think fatigue immediately. Yeah. Which is so weird because no one thinks like that with comic book movies. With horror movies, as soon as there was the word four, five, six, seven, they're like, oh my God, they're flogging this franchise. It's there forever. But then Marvel, because it's all connected in a different sort of way... People don't seem to care. They're like, oh, okay, four fours. Sure, that sounds fine. You know, it's 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 a weird. I think the difference is as well is that is that uh, maybe it's the most audience. of these most no. of these franchises realised what they were by a certain point. Uh, like the the um, horror franchises oh. from the eight from the eighties and that sort of period. Like, and they became they sort of reflected on that and. Um, I don't know, became more ridiculous and more farcical from that. And then to when you think of um, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, um, in terms of like a, a, fine, a final sort of like, uh, what is, bookend for, yeah, the, yeah. for that um, franchise, uh, it, 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 to it was totally meta and totally played in on itself and sort of looked at itself. And, and I feel like that's quite an intelligent way to... to well, maybe it's the finance finish thing. Finish that off. Like, I just, I just wanted to say a quick thing with horrors, yeah? What happens when they have sequels? The budget goes lower and lower and lower and lower, mm -hmm. and eventually the film comes out on like in the old days VHS, now DVD or VOD. But if you think about Marvel films, you have the complete opposite with with franchises. It's mm. let's make the sequel more and more expensive, you know. Yeah. Except from like there's, there's more investment into it. Like the horror films must have not been as sort of uh, marketable in that way. And maybe it's because horrors are designed for you know teenagers, adults, whereas comic book movies are designed for all audiences, generally, yeah, but I, made the major audience, kids. I think, mm. right, so, like, whenever it comes to horrors, if you think about the 80s, mm. like, and this could just be my personal opinion, and agree with me or disagree with me, but um, 
there were so many different horror franchises going on that actually made it quite stale very quickly. And regardless mm. of budgets and stuff, it started. It kept trying to push the boundaries of how can we top the last film? How can we? And it just became very repetitive, but also farcical. And then nowadays with the Marvel franchise, where they they keep it fresh, and I, I like, I'm a the biggest critic of Marvel whenever it comes to, it, and I'm a fan, but. They keep it fresh by introducing new characters. Mm. So when you think of Phase 1 and Phase 2 of Marvel, you've got the Iron Mans, the Thors, Captain America, and then you've got the first Avengers, and then you've got Age of Ultron. And I think it was the end of Phase 2, they introduced the Guardians of the Galaxy. And like loads of people were really apprehensive about that because it's brand new characters. But that's what kept the franchise going because it was fresh, it was new. So that's kind of given them the opportunity to introduce more new characters. And like that's why they could, spoilers, kill off Iron Man, Captain America, so that they can create Phase 4 and go into this new breath of fresh air. But it's still, the franchise is still making the money, but it's never really stale because you're seeing a I new think character. If, uh, if we go I on um, it's a sort of franchise in total flux because you never have a main character that's continuously leading no, it. Whereas do. the horror film, well, no, you, 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 you do and you don't because you always have like specific characters. You don't have one character that is basically the, the lead of the whole. Yeah, the whole I, I would, yeah, I would agree with that to a degree. But, but whereas I think when you look at the um, horror film, Films in the eighties, it's um, one character. It's one yes. character all the way through, and so yeah, that does that does watch get in terms, one in terms of, all of them. yeah, but in terms of that, right? Yeah, no, exactly. You can watch a random one without watching all of them, but in terms of that, you think about it. You would have a horror film come out in let's say nineteen eighty, right? And then it would take two years for the second one to come out, and then another two years. Every whereas year, man. they were every, they, they every were year. Every year. Yeah. <laughs> I swear the Halloweens were like every couple of years. Well, the Jasons and the Freddies. Okay, so but with Marvel. <laughs> They still keep that formula in a sense because you would have an Iron Man in 2008. Then there's an Iron Man. But yeah, but that's just Disney, this is, this that's is like just a, this is just but then a you have way them to... in like a film that's a year later. Like so, you do still have your iconic characters that you follow. Like Iron Man is probably the most iconic within the Marvel universe, and that was set up in Phase One and Two. So yeah, but that's, that's, that's that. what I'm saying is that where the, their franchise is a universe, so that there's you so can't the, watch you around. don't have a main mm. character in that in because. that fr- like in that sort of thing. Whereas with those horror films, they were building them out of films originally, so you didn't have all of this sort of background yeah. Um, yeah, like okay. story so and like narrative to build out of. So really, it's just of, a very clever business yeah, strategy, yeah, yeah. essentially. Of that's what Every studio is trying to jump on. They're trying to find mm. things that have a huge world that they can explore. In, and because TV is a lot different nowadays, they can explore through TV VOD, yeah. they can explore through film, they can explore through a computer game and just make tons of money. Mm. And I think that's the big problem because for one, it's alienating. If you are just a film goer and not a fan of that particular thing, you can't really like get I said, on board because you haven't seen the last one yeah, or whatever. You mm. have to be there from the beginning. And it's almost like the weirdest elite group possible. Because these films, you know, the Avengers Endgame is the most successful film of all time now. Mm. It beat Avatar, right? Still not a great film. (laughs) But you see what I mean? Like, you're part of this elite crowd that's watched 20 films collectively, but really, everyone in the world is part of that group. So if you're not part of that group, it's a really weird thing. It's difficult. Yeah, there are a lot of franchises, arguably, like even the John Wick franchise, you could walk into number three and be like, what's all the fuss about it? But like, yeah, you can see the killing of the dog. Well, they, kind of, <laughs> they kind of explain it, though, don't they? They reiterate different points that have happened. Yeah. And it's very easy to jump into that and be like, oh, okay, he's an assassin and he's going around and think, killing people that have done wrong to him. I think John Wick works slightly differently as sequels, though, because it literally starts up where it leaves off every single time. It's never There's never like a... Uh, you know, uh, so and so uh, many years later, yeah, they've just yeah. left it at the end of that that sort of big fight sequence, and then boom. Next I don't one. always, I don't always think that works. So, no, it like with John Wick, it definitely works. Um, keeps you in the action constantly, yeah, with John Wick. Whereas, like other constantly things, flowing, it can be a bit. I love the way that the second one ends, and it kind of then the third one starts, and he's walking through the town, and mm. the dogs there with him, and it's raining, and it's like, oh my god, you've got one hour, like get the fuck out of there. <laughs> um, yeah, but you're constantly on edge. It mm. just puts you in the thick of it. And it doesn't need to explain the fact of what's gone on before. You're just in it. Exactly. And I think where he, like, what they've done well with John Wick to be able to keep it going for four films with one lead character that, that and it hasn't got stale, even though that it's just been continuous, is that they do exactly what they've always done. And it's just 
It's over the, the top, yeah, farcical kind of It's the same of, like, creative slapstick. team. When you have the same creative team who have the drive to tell mm. the story. Yeah, exactly. It's come from a creative place. In yeah. terms but not of only that, I think... Rather than a business place. Yeah. I think also, not only that, like, you, you do have your creative, um, like, good storytelling and stuff, but also with the choreography, mm. I think that's what keeps it fresh. Like, how many action films have you seen where they have a fight sequence and it's really basic and kind <clears> of... <throat> a bit amateurish and you're like oh well, I'm not really that engaged like oh, I, I could have punched him and knocked him out but with John Wick it's constant like they train it's, it's, hours um, upon hours and days and it's mm. funny how if you let's look at the action franchise in that regards yeah I was just when, when we were talking about John Wick Mission like, Impossible well yeah. what, I, what I mean more is sense of like we think about the classics yeah so the Alien the first Alien is a masterpiece yeah mm. where is it now it's a mess yeah. Die Hard mm. Where is it now? It's a mess desperately trying to make prequels that still feature Bruce Willis. And you're like, the guy's nearly 70. <laughs> <laughs> even like we well, look they at... they got a DH and stuff now, so... Even if we look at like um, <laughs> Rambo, Rocky, any of these icons that genuinely the first films are classics of like Hollywood cinema, mm. they always get filtered down. Even if it's like being shot over, you know, like the last Rambo came out last year, but Rambo started in the 80s. Yeah. I, I get the appeal, but because it's the same... I don't know, it's just, you get this filtered down version because it's never going to be the pure thing that they creatively set out to do. The last Rambo was pretty much an adult version of Home Alone. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> like, what I mean. Like, there's, there's a certain point where it's just like, this doesn't work anymore. Well, I don't think Rocky got still. Well, maybe. It, it probably got still. Like, what? Rocky Five is 1990. And then you had Rocky Balboa, which is 2006. Yeah. Um, but they and, recrafted it for Creed. They yeah, knew exactly. How to so they, it. Yeah, exactly. And like Rocky isn't at the forefront and they changed the name and everything. So they started to build a new franchise mm. off the back of a franchise. It's like, I think the one thing people need to remember with franchises is franchises are good. They just get in the wrong hands, get easily corrupted. Yeah. You look at Planet of the Apes, yeah? Planet of the Apes, the first film, considered a classic. All the sequels no one wanted to talk about because they get silly and ridiculous. And then they were going to reboot it, and everyone was like, "Oh God, another reboot! This isn't going to be very good." No, but then it's good. I think, I think, like, Far we, superior. Uh, like, it's mm. it's about creative intent. It's it's yeah, it's about how they decide to yeah. how they decide to sort of go about producing that film. Because if that studio says like, right, we're investing a lot of money in this, we need this, 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 and this. We need to sort of just make sure that we get those things. It it kind of like uh, makes it weaker, a lot weaker. Yeah. Whereas if it's if the if it's being made from sort of yeah, like you said, pure creative intentions, then there is some sort of hope for it as a franchise. It can be it can be well done. Um, but as we were we were saying earlier about um, directors and how they're used in um, franchises. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that play that's sort of similar in that that sense because you know you'll have they're kind of disposable. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. I, I know, like within the. Um, well, with Disney, how many Star Wars films have you seen where they dispose of a, yeah. a, a director straight off the bat? Yeah. And it's just it's like, about keeping... It's like a need and necessity. It's like creative need is very different to financial need. Mm. And if certain things just like pop and spike, let's look at the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Yeah. You know, the yeah. first one is a genuinely great film. Well, uh, two and three are good as well. They, they, they are and they're not because they're also a bit of ego indulgence, but they're nowhere near as bad as the fourth one. And the fifth. Yeah, it just became... I do love On Stranger Tides um, simply because, well, it was, I don't know. I've rewatched it so many times and I really like it, yeah. but I see the flaws and it was just a money making scheme. That's it. They're all... Jack Sparrow should never have been the central character. He was yeah. always good as a, like a side character. Mm. It's like you had that mystery and that quirkiness. And by the fifth one, they basically give you his origin and it's like, oh. The thing is, that's the thing. They, they just, they milk the character, but they don't try to build anything new around it. No, there's no new substance. And if you think Pirates of the Caribbean, how did Pirates of the Caribbean start before it was a film? It was a theme park. Yes, theme park, right? It's yeah. already like wanted to build a franchise. It just did it really well to start with, and it kind of just hit like a zeitgeist moment where people were like, "I love pirates and I love Johnny Depp. What a great moment!" <laughs> and I think that's the thing. Like, that, genuinely was, that must be have been the reasoning. reasoning for that that video game because I, I I had a video game of Pirates of the Caribbean when I was a kid, but you did not play as a single character <laughs> from Pirates of the Caribbean the film. Yeah. Um, you didn't follow the storyline. You just you you just like traveled from island to island, selling things and buying things, and then there was like a storyline. Yeah, it was like an RPG. It was really strange, but it great game. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? Like I said, it's companion pieces. Mm. And essentially, the film was a companion piece to a theme park ride. Yeah. And it doesn't always work. There was another one they attempted to do with um, The Haunted Mansion. There was a film version with Eddie Murphy, and it was going to be this big franchise. This was about a year or so just before Pirates of the Caribbean. Famous ride, everybody likes it. Yeah. 2000. And yeah, essentially, it didn't work. The film bombed, no one liked it, and there was no Ghost Mansion franchise. Well, Maldo Toro has been talking about doing it for years, but he talks about a lot of things. <laughs> I think it's an interesting one. Like, on a perspective franchise, for, for us as Trash Outs, like, we would love to have a horror franchise because it would be interesting to create something and then put it into, um, a, a, you know, a new young creator's hands. Like, we've disc- like horror does, mm. you know? See, my personal perspective with franchises, as far as, like, what we do as filmmaking, no one sets out to make a franchise. But there are some stories that you go, okay, I'd love to see that in another person's hands and see where they take the characters. Well, not necessarily characters, but because I'm talking more about horror here, but the horror element, the monster, the boogeyman, whatever it is. Um, But I would be really pissed off if the franchise got really bad quickly. And in my own personal experience, having done a lot of anthologies, they do start to get weaker as they go. And you start to feel a bit like, well, why am I doing this? And I think... um, that's why like, you, you have to sort of either become something fresh or just go, okay, we'll, we'll close that franchise on that point. And I think that's the most important thing. So when taking it with our own films, I, I really want to build franchises. I want to like, have those sort of bringing in different directors and getting them to do a creative interpretation of it. And that's how like, the whole thing in the horror started. It was about bringing in new voices to work with it, but they just had less of a budget each time. I think we're on a different level than major franchises. So for us, if someone were to take something and make it terrible, like that would be a catastrophe because we're already independent filmmakers. Like no, but I mean, like even to, I know no, a lot of indie um, directors. You get what I'm who, saying. Like yeah, you if, always want to have quality control. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, but there's still room to breathe there. You can still manage that in a very nice way. Whereas when you take big franchises like Disney do with Marvel or Disney do with Star Wars. It becomes completely different and they monetize it. They monetize it something shocking and it's just a bit, mm, you're kind of tainting the content that's coming out. Exactly. There's, there needs to be that care and a lot of franchises, when you watch a lot of behind the scenes, especially with horror, it's still a lot of the same producers who were there on the first film or it's the same costume design or the same makeup eyes. It's the studios giving them less money each time. So you still have that creative team who genuinely wanted to make those films. But they, they a lot of films in the 80s in particular, they were cut like crazy for the violence, especially in Jason films. So you never really got full interpretation of what the creator wanted to do. Mm. And I think it's all down to that, really. It's kind of sad, really. Why would you hire a director? The director's there to be creative and control the process of a film, and then you ax them. Producer's or... always ahead, though. <laughs> yeah, I know, but... Why put a director in place then if you've already got your own vision? It's kind of, it's a double-edged sword. Like that's when it earlier. becomes capitalist greed. So that leads me to my final point, guys, is um, do you think franchises are good for film or do you think they're negative for film? Jack? Uh, then I think that they're, they're positive to an extent but mainly negative simply because the way that a, a franchise is sort of born is through sort of like capitalist interest. And so I feel like that's always going to like water down the creative um, process. creative process and it's always going to have that effect to a certain extent. Although I do enjoy quite a few franchises and, you know, uh, particularly, particularly the older ones that are just fun and kind of silly... Um, but I don't know. I don't know if they're positive or negative. I just feel like they're a phenomenon. You're on the fence. Yeah, they're a phenomenon <laughs> within film that you can uh, either take with in a good way of um, looking at creativity, or you you can take in a negative way by looking at the way that it's sort of set up and and the the purposes by which of just milking something a creative idea until it's dry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, either or. Sam. <laughs> I'm in a certain place with Jack. I mean, I'm more positive about it when I think of like, when I think about indie filmmakers, yeah, and how many of them have their own franchises for their serial killers they've created. And their little fandom absolutely loves it. And it's something that's always going to be there as a legacy to that particular character. And I love that idea. 
And I think if anything, independent films and in some ways genre picks, even though there's the greed at the top, there's still a love to try and keep to what the fans want without it being a pre-existing world. Mm. What's gone wrong is that Hollywood now just wants pre-existing world or wants a world as quick as possible instead of allowing it to slowly develop by making good films. And to me, that's where I'm a bit like franchise fatigue. You know? yeah. But I'm always open to a franchise interpretation because I'm like, oh, maybe this one will be good. Because why not? It happens now and then. Sometimes the sixth, seventh one could be the best one of the lot. It, well, you just got a question, did it need to get all the way up to the seventh <laughs> yeah, point yeah, yeah. to realise what they do? For me, um, I think that in terms of franchises, if it's given to the right person who has the right creative mind, you can actually make something really good. Mm. Um, so if you take Guardians of the Galaxy, for example, like with James Gunn at the helm, he was given creative control and made something that was absolutely unique and special and really cool and quirky. And then um, Thor Ragnarok ended up kind of following suit with that kind of 80s vibe and synth and quirky colours and stuff like that. So franchises are cool, but they need to be in the right hands and they need to be, like directors need to be given that creative process, that creative control to be able to build out their vision and what they want yeah. to make it their own unique thing that then they can the, the company can then build on always back creative <laughs> <laughs> anyway guys um, thank you for listening to the podcast remember our first six episodes of the podcast are now on Spotify so please go check that out and um, we've also got our website www.trasharts.co.uk be in the description below check that out some of our contents on there give us a like give us a subscribe leave us a comment if there's anything you want us to talk about um, and also don't forget that we've got the senseless indiegogo page going on we've hit our target we've raised the target two grand as sam said um, but any more support would help with us trying to further the film and actually make it a little bit more creative i suppose um, and yeah, as ever, please subscribe. Anyway, guys, thank you. Trash Hearts take out. Bye-bye. Ta-da.